Hello, everybody. We are currently in Boston. Welcome to the Monday Morning Class. We're going to be talking about what it means to be a person, how to be a person in this very depersonized, depersonified, alienating world. We are joined here live by Jeneline. Hello. Good morning. Who's with us today. Jeneline edits all of these classes <laughs> and provides a comforting real life presence. So thank you very a much. A little for bit being of background. Um, as you can tell, we are not in our car today. We are currently in Boston, mm -hmm. where we're going to be for five days or so. We wanted to show you outside, but it is beautiful sunny weather, and so we're quite overlit. So we just thought we'd turn around and you could see this, you know. I realize, especially on YouTube, like my car. face is like totally <laughs> like lit up. Anyway, low production values, as yes. per usual. Um, I'll just scoot in a little bit. If you're joining us for the very first time today, welcome to our learning community. We're so glad that you're here. Mm -hmm. um, we have students from around the world who are joining us on this, I don't know, in this learning community mm -hmm. in which we gather together to take things quite seriously, to think about the world, to think about what it means to be alive, to philosophize, and to have a community of people who are not only like-minded, but creating a space in which we can be thoughtful and intelligent and critical together in a way that might usually not feel as, as normal. So we wanna, we wanna try to normalize a kind of critical engagement with what it means to be alive and what it means to live in this strange place that we call the world in the 21st century. Um, so yeah, if you're joining us for the very first time, there's a couple of things that Jenling has in terms of housekeeping. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. We want to know where you're joining us from. We have, as Julian said, students from around the world, and that brings us a lot of joy. Uh, we also have a Patreon where you can find both the audio downloads of the class as well as the Q&A afterwards. We have a Discord community you can join. We have an ebook that is up for another month or so. There are also uh, audio for that, so check it out. If you're interested, send me a message. And, uh, yeah. That's right. Jeneline does an amazing job organizing most of the logistics of our community. <laughs> so big thank you to Jeneline for helping us keep this on the road. And big thank you to all of our patrons who help us teach these classes everywhere. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be traveling for the next six months. So yeah, hopefully... someone's joining us from New York. We're going to be in New York next. We're really excited. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Um, so if you're joining us for the first time, this is going to be an introduction to Zizek class, essentially. But through Zizek, we're going to talk about Lacan, we're going to talk about Hegel, and lots of other different ideas. And if you have zero experience with any of those thinkers, that's totally fine. Because the goal here is not to dumb it down, but to universalize it, to hopefully make it something that's accessible and intuitive for people, no matter what your background is, no matter where you are in the world. That's, that's going to be what we're talking about. Okay, I think we should just jump right in. So stick with us for the next hour or so mm -hmm. as, we, as we dive into Zizek's theory of the subject. Zizek's theory of subjectivity. That's where we left off in the previous class in this lecture, seri lecture, lecture series. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're slightly jet-lagged. We're super jet-lagged. <laughs> it's like really, really early for us. Okay. So Jenny and I, you and I saw a movie um, a couple days ago, mm. not a couple days ago, a couple, a week ago or so. Yes. And it's a movie that most of you probably haven't seen, but it's a movie called The Worst Person in the World. Yes. And it's a very interesting movie. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And there's a scene in The Worst Person of the World, which is probably the most beautiful description of how the unconscious functions. Mm -hmm. First of all, there's a big difference within psychoanalysis between the unconscious and the subconscious. I'm glad you're doing this. Now, <laughs> the subconscious, we have this idea that um, if you think about your personality as like an iceberg, that there's the subconscious that is beneath the water, right? There's this idea that there's this entire inner dimension that you experience that is in a sense unaccounted for, that is not fully your responsibility. This is why I mentioned this in the previous book, but Freud has this joke where he says that psychoanalysis is more extreme than Christianity and religion. Why? Because in religion, there are many things that you are not responsible for if you didn't do them. In psychoanalysis, you're responsible for them even if you didn't do them, in a sense. And so the traditional way of thinking about the subconscious as like this vast expanse of our unaccounted for, unacknowledged part of us, of our personality, is strictly speaking not what Freud and Lacan mean by the unconscious. It's very important to note that the unconscious isn't buried beneath. You can't blame anything on your unconscious. This is 
one of the problems with the entire sort of clinical psychological language that we have about like unconscious bias, for example, is the idea that you have a bias or a prejudice that is formed in an, in an unconscious way, right? Like it's not part of your consciousness as such. And so in a sense, you could almost blame it, right? You could say, well, I'm not a racist, but on the level of the unconscious, I simply don't like black people or something, right? I mean, that would be like the most stereotypical way of looking at it. From a Freudian Lacanian perspective, you can't blame your unconscious. You are fully responsible for your unconscious. And we'll, we'll see what I mean by that as we move on. Okay, so what's important here is you and I were talking about a movie that we saw. Mm -hmm. And the movie was the movie The Worst Person in the World. And there's a scene in The Worst Person in the World in which the main character, a young woman, um, is tempted to cheat. So she's in a relationship and she's tempted to have an affair. She's not sure why. It's not that she doesn't love her partner. She's in a very happy relationship to all intents and purposes. And yet she is tempted by temptation itself. Um, spoilers for worst person in the world, but not really. And so what happens is that she goes to a party and she meets another man who's also in a committed relationship. And she basically says, I don't want to cheat because I love my partner. And he says, well, I don't want to cheat because I love my partner. And yet clearly, they like the idea of cheating. In other words, what turns them on isn't the other person. What turns them on is the fact that they're not supposed to cheat. And they engage in this elaborate, very Sadian courtship by which they try to test the boundaries, the symbolic boundaries, of what it means to cheat. Now, what does it mean to cheat? <laughs> right? The limits of fidelity, yeah. Exactly. What are the limits of fidelity in a relationship? Ordinarily, Part of what makes it really easy is we say, well, cheating is a physical act. Cheating is when you kiss somebody or you have sex with them. But of course, there's many ways in which you technically could cheat that could feel like a betrayal of your fidelity. Mm -hmm. For example, a betrayal of trust, or you could, you could grant someone intimacy that you wouldn't grant your partner. Mm -hmm. Like it's very hurtful for a parent, for example, to realize that their child will confide in their friends or in their lovers, but not in the parent. And so in a weird way, the child has cheated on the parent mm -hmm. at that point because it's no longer a relationship of pure love and trust. There's mm -hmm. a third person. So there's many ways in which we can cheat on somebody. And yet formally, most people think that cheating is you have done X, you've mm -hmm. committed the act, which makes sense because part of being in a relationship is that you say that you are physically exclusive. It would right. be ridiculous and, and tantamount to control and gaslighting if you told the person you're not allowed to tell other people any secrets, or you're not allowed to have friends and talk with them, etc. I don't know if this is something you want to weigh in on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, no, I'm with you. Okay. And so what, in the worst person in the world, what does she do? Well, she begins an elaborate sequence of not cheating. You could call it cheating by means of not cheating. And the reason that I said that there's a Sadian dimension here is that it properly understands that what's really erotic isn't necessarily the hasty kiss or the fling, the one night stand. What's really erotic is precisely the things that are considered taboo in ordinary relationships. One of the best scenes is that they decide that as part of their not cheating, they start with sharing secrets. I'm going to tell you something that I've never told anybody else before. Mm -hmm. And they sort of exchange intimacies, right? This is this, the thing that I have within me that I keep from everybody else. I am now giving to you. So that's how they first start cheating through enunciation, essentially. And then they move on to another taboo, which is something that only couples do, I imagine, which is going to the bathroom whilst the other person is in the same room, right? <laughs> so a couple will like go to the bathroom mm -hmm. and the other person can be in the same room. It's not really taboo. Yeah. Like that's a sign. If you want to know when you're in a committed relationship, <laughs> it's when one person goes to the bathroom. First, they leave the door open. <laughs> Secondly, they don't leave the door open, but they just start talking to you. That's a second sign. The third sign, the completion, is when they expect you to be in the bathroom while they're talking to you. Yes. And it could be something like you're brushing your teeth and the other person's going to the bathroom. Yeah. But there's that ultimate intimacy, which is like the sharing of what is otherwise a restricted taboo thing, which is going to the bathroom. And so part of her cheating, not cheating, is to watch him urinate in a men's bathroom and then vice versa for him to watch her urinate in a women's bathroom. But I think they're not watching. I think just listening. But no, I no. can't. No, they're okay. watching. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it doesn't matter. No, no, they're in yeah. the room. Yeah. Yeah. No, he watches her in quite, in quite great detail. It's, it's distinctly voyeuristic the way in which he observes her going to the bathroom. 
And yet, strictly speaking, it's not sexual, right? It's sort of the opposite of sexual. Well, it's the idea of what is transgression. Exactly, what is transgression? And in this case, transgress, that's a very nice way to put it. And in this case, transgression is doing something that you would otherwise only do with your partner. And so they spend an entire night together until dawn, doing all these seemingly illicit acts, yet that do not properly function as cheating. Mm -hmm. Now, here we have what you would call, in Lacanian terms, the symbolic order. The symbolic order is the way in which you participate in society by following the rules of what it means to be a person, and yet you withhold the fundamental dimension of your own being from that. Mm -hmm. Now, the Lacanian insight here, and I want to stress this, is that the thing that you think you are withholding doesn't exist. So when you participate in the symbolic rituals of society, you think that you're withholding a true intimate self, but the intimate self is what exists on the level of the imaginary. In other words, I'm sharing my true self with you is an imaginary, illusionary idea predicated on the, the pact, the Faustian pact, by which you constitute your own being in society. Now I'll give you another, another um, more technical example of this. For Lacan, it's always about the difference when it comes to subjectivity between the subject of the enunciation and the subject of the statement. Now, strictly speaking in French, if you go back to the écrit, it's the difference between the subject of the enunciation and the enuncié. In other words, the difference between the subject of the enunciation and the enunciated. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to get into linguistics and sign signify here, but on a very basic level, as soon as you speak, as soon as you say something, you are acting on the level of enunciation. You have, you have in a sense, created yourself in the world. I speak, mm -hmm. I am. You articulate something. Exactly. And the subject of the statement of the enuncié is the subject that you created by means of your enunciation. In other words, what it means is that as soon as you speak, as Hegel already put it, you are doomed. As soon as you speak, you are, you are, you are bound to be misinterpreted, not only by others, but by yourself. And then you will spend the rest of your life speaking more, trying to make up for that which you have already said, which was already a poor communication of that which you originally thought. Now, the Freudian insight, I don't want to skip too far ahead, but the Freudian insight is that this is already the subject of the unconscious. In other words, the idea that you had an original thought that you wanted to express that wasn't in some way pre-mediated by your failure to express that which never existed in advance, that is the subject of the unconscious. In other words, in the same way that you believe that there's an imaginary pure self underneath your symbolic self, the subject of the enunciation believes that there is an imaginary pure thought that wanted to be expressed a priori before expression itself. In other words, the metaphysical argument Lacan is making here, which is structuralist in that it takes linguistics and combines it with metaphysics, is precisely that the idea that there was an a priori universal thought that you wanted to express in a particular manner, that there was that kind of starting point of your own constitutive being, that is the ultimate illusion. It's an ultimate illusion that is retroactively generated. To go back to the idea of the iceberg, we don't have here is speech and underneath is the full well of my pure authentic being. And it's the exact opposite, which is that there is only that which is above the water, which retroactively creates the illusion that there is a world underneath. That is the subject of the unconscious, which is for Lacan the difference between the subject of the statement and the subject, uh, sorry, subject of the enunciation and the enunciated. But it gets a little bit more interesting because Lacan goes all the way back to the pre-Socratic philosophers and says, what about, and I think Diogenes already writes about this, what about a paradoxical statement? For example, I am lying. Hmm. If you say I am lying, then in a strange sense you've created like a closed loop. Like a short circuit. Exactly. When I say I am lying, does that mean that I speak the truth? Ergo, I am not lying. I am speaking the truth about my own lie. Or vice versa, is it that I am lying? And therefore, because I'm lying about lying, I am speaking the truth. It's one of those Ouroboros arguments that kind of like a snake eating its own tail, mm -hmm. depending on how you interpret it. Now, Lacan goes over this a couple times in different seminars and he changes his mind a little bit. But the ultimate point is that the I am lying, the paradox of I am lying, is the paradox that is constitutive to subjectivity itself. If you wanted to put it in a rhetorical structure, something I've talked about before, you could compare it to the chiasm. 
A chiasmic sequence, you had a really nice one the other day mm. about thinking and speaking. Yeah, it's a tagline for a news show that is something like, I don't tell you what to think, I think about what you tell me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't tell you what to think, I think about what you tell me. Here we mm -hmm. have a classic chiasmic statement, which mm -hmm. is like, it mirrors a rhetorical structure, which is A, B, B, A. I don't, what was it again? I don't tell you what to think. Yeah. I think about what you tell me. Exactly. So tell would be A and think would be B. I don't tell A you what to think, B. I think B about what, what you, you tell, tell me. me. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have A, B, B, A. It's also an example of the enunciation and the enunciated in a sense because it's yeah. also switching the direction of speaking subject object. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, it's so great. I'm super glad that you're with yeah. me here because I'm worried that's like to... No, no, it's exactly what I'm trying to point out here, which is that the whole point is that in the ABBA sequence, from a chiasmic perspective, which also goes again back to the pre-Socratics, there's a, the idea that the X moment, the, mo the constitutive moment exists in between. There's no starting point upon which you have a sequence of development of thought or speech. Is that in a weird way, they've always already happened to take Hegel's idea, because eventually by next week, we'll be back to Hegel, of course, here. And next so, week will be almost already. And this is, of course, how we get to what Lacan calls Spaltung. I mean, Spaltung is Freudian German. Obviously, uh, Lacan wrote in French. But the idea of Spaltung is the idea of the split subject, split subjectivity. And what's important about split subjectivity is basically this. It's really hard to be a person. Like, this is fundamentally, like, if you're watching this, I want you to, I want you to know that I, I feel you and I understand you, that the ultimate responsibility that we have in the world is creating what it means to be a subject. And Lacan believes that we create ourselves by means of speech. In other words, not only do we participate in the symbolic order, we participate in society by means of speech, we specifically create an idea of ourselves through speech. Both an idea that we present towards others and an idea that we present to ourselves. Now, you don't need to have a degree in psychoanalysis or something like that to understand this. It's totally universal, which is that fundamentally, everybody feels like a fraud. Everybody feels like they have fraud complex, like they're faking it, like we're not real. We don't properly inhabit our own body. We don't properly inhabit our own failures, our own successes. We feel in a weird way alienated from the core of what it means to be alive. That other people are more real than we are. And at the same time, we have this fundamental, and this is true for even clinical psychology, this fundamental misassumption that other people have it better figured out than we do. That other people somehow have an edge or an advantage that they've done something or said something that makes them a real person. And that we somehow are lacking this, which other people have. Now, for Lacan, this is very literal. When Lacan talks about lack or monk in French, he says, Lack is simply the process by which you think that others aren't lacking. Lack isn't, I'm missing something required to make me whole. Lack isn't insecurity. Lack is the misassumption that other people don't lack. In other words, that other people have it more figured out than you, that other people are in fact complete human beings, and that you are somehow missing something. This is something that I saw Hank Green said a couple years ago that I thought was really beautiful. He's talking about conspicuous consumption. By means we, you know, the idea that you spend on things that you don't really need, like pure, like pure fetish objects, like expensive cars or expensive clothing or clothing with like big brands on them, etc. And, and Hank Green basically described like this. He said, all you're doing is you're creating a hole in somebody else by trying to fill a hole in yourself. If you put that in the terms of lack, it basically means you're trying to substitute the lack in yourself by creating a lack in somebody else. And that starts with the misassumption that other people don't have a lack, that other people are complete. And so it's not just, oh, I'm this empty, vain person who's trying to fill a hole in myself. It's specifically related to the whole of the other. In other words, the, the experience that the other is not lacking. And that because I somehow lack, I need what the other has, which is lack of lack itself, <laughs> essentially. And this is also why Lacan links lack to desire, that it's not just desire for something. Nobody just wants the car. Nobody just wants to have the clothes. You want the dream. You don't want the thing. And the dream is, of course, related to how you experience yourself vis-a-vis -vis other people. This also, I think, really goes back to the scene that you're talking about from Worst Person in the World. What they want isn't infidelity. 
They want to they want to test the border. They want the illusion of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They want that which they can't have. What is the one thing you can't have in a relationship? You can't have a lover. Right. This is, of course, also precisely why the problem with quitting your relationship in order to be with your lover mm -hmm. is not only that it then makes your lover into your relationship, it's that in a strict, you, the essence of what your lover was, you lose mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. Now your lover is no longer your lover, they're the person who is your constitutive partner. <laughs> and so in many ways, it's better to just have a lover as a lover, which is something that many French, French existentialists already kind of realized, which I'm not trying to like <laughs> affirm toxic behaviors here or anything. Obviously, infidelity is one of the worst things people can experience. Um, this is also why Lacan says that all jealousy is pathological. In other words, it, you're not jealous. Like, the example Lacan uses is very famous. He says that even if your partner is actually cheating on you, it remains pathological. Your jealousy remains pathological. In other words, even if the thing that you're worried about turns out to be based in fact, your fear remains pathological. Hmm. It's a pathological fear of being abandoned by the other person. And then even if they do abandon you, that doesn't make your fear not pathological. You're a skeptical. No, that would not. Well, that would just be not very comforting. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we're not in the business of comforting people here. Yeah. And so, okay, so why are we talking about this? We're talking about the difference between the subject of enunciation and the and the subject of the statement, that which is being enunciated, and the idea that there's a kind of split subject for Lacan, which is the subject of I am lying. And I want to go back to the idea of the lie, because you cannot function in society without lying. Everybody learns from a very early point, and this isn't even nihilism, this is just pure realism, that unless you learn how to lie, unless you learn to participate in the beautiful lie that is civilization mm -hmm. and the process of being in the world, then you have nothing, right? This is the whole point of like animalistic existence is an existence that is amoral in that sense, as in there is no responsibility for the animal to participate in a moralistic lie on behalf of the idea of society. Last week we talked about the dark night, and I wanna say one more thing about that, which is that Plato has this idea of the beautiful lie, and that's something that Zizek talks about apropos the Batman in the dark night. Mm -hmm. At the end of the dark night, the Batman chooses to become the villain in order to uphold the beautiful lie of the society that has got them. This is how all ideology functions within any society and civilization, is that you believe in it precisely because it's not true. We believe in our better natures precisely because we know that we are of a lesser nature. That the whole point isn't to demonstrate how good we actually are, but how good we could be. That's the idea of ideology. And so I wanna push back a little bit on people who said ideology is inherently bad. Ideology can be a perfectly good thing. Ideology is how you frame your experience of the world, how you give it meaning. And so ideology may be overarching and false, but it is not false consciousness. Ironically, false consciousness from an existentialist perspective or for the structuralist, like, or, or even like Sartre's uh, mauvaise foi, false consciousness is precisely the idea that you are above or beyond ideology. As soon as you think that you're in a non-ideological space, you're precisely in the realm of ideology. And so false consciousness is the false consciousness, which would then also through Marxism be developed, by which you suggest that there is a universal that doesn't succumb into the falsehood of its own particular. In other words, and this is something we will develop further because I know I'm going too fast here. The whole idea is that within the lie of society, it's not enough to know that it's a lie. You have to, in a sense, be the agent of the lie refracted upon itself. Now that's a very complicated thing to say, but that's ultimately what Marx would later call class consciousness. It's not enough to know that the commodity fetish is not true. In other words, it's not enough to see that the fetish is a fetish to demystify it. Just because you say something like, well, this t-shirt that has a Nike swoosh on it shouldn't be more valuable than one that does have a Nike swoosh on it, doesn't actually change the value. Just because you see through it doesn't collectively change the consciousness, unless of course everybody decided to see through it. But the point of ideology for Zizek is precisely that everybody sees through it. That it's not that there's anyone who genuinely believes that a Nike swoosh t-shirt is more valuable, except we believe that other people believe. That's what you always say about finance. It's like the, 
it's not choosing who's the most beautiful woman. Yeah, it's um, this was from um, Keynes. The stock market, investing in the stock market isn't about choosing the best thing. It's about choosing what other people think is the best thing. Yeah. And that's the whole nature behind speculation. You don't choose what you think is valuable. You choose what other people are going to invest in. And I think it's valuable. But here's the thing. By means of that falsehood, yeah. it becomes valuable. Yes, exactly. As in the ultimate lie, the ultimate false consciousness would be the idea that underneath that mystical whatever ideology yep. there is such a thing as true value or true beauty well and it's really funny to see how that gets reinforced on say in a room up full of traders because they're i mean the way that they pass time is someone calls out you know an outrageous scenario or some world event and they talk through how they would respond to it as investors so it's perpetually the cycle of coming up with hypothetical what ifs and imagining how they would respond to it and how the market would be shaped by these hypothetical events. Yeah. Totally, yeah. And and what's really important from like a Marxist and again, psychoanalytic perspective here is that Marx didn't believe that there was such a thing as originary value, mm -hmm. that there was value on sich. You can already see the comparison here to psychoanalysis and the subconscious and the unconscious, which is there's no, there's no unconscious buried beneath the false consciousness of you know the ego and the ego ideal, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now, what Marx, what Marx was basically arguing is something that you could understand perfectly well from today's perspective on crypto. You've probably heard about NFTs, and you've also heard about, yeah, you're, sorry, you're rolling no, your no, eyes. No, no, no. Jenlene hates, Jenlene is really, really, this is very different because I'm interested in everything. You're much more moralistic. Like I'm interested if I just, in hating everything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I get that. Okay, so the thing about NFTs is that an NFT is simply, I mean, simply, it's a non-fungible token. I'm not going to explain NFTs to you. I want to focus on the idea of fungible because what's interesting is that an NFT, you've probably seen it as like people spending like a million dollars on like a Twitter profile picture or something, right? But the thing about an NFT is it cuts straight to the chase of one of the most interesting debates within Marxism, which is how is value created? Now, crypto is supposed to be fungible. In other words, the whole point of crypto, the whole point of a decentralized ideology of cryptocurrencies, as far as I understand it, because I'm sure plenty of people will know more about this than me, is the idea that you can exchange one coin for another coin. But this is the principle behind all money, is that it is fungible. A yeah. dollar bill is equal to another dollar it, bill. Exactly. That's a dollar, exactly. That's the whole point yeah. of a fungibility, is that mm -hmm. you create this exchange. And fungibility solves a problem, which is the problem of abstraction. How do you take the value of a cow and you compare it to the value of a bag of rice? How do you swap them? This is also why the ultimate ideological fantasy is the idea of the barter economy that came before the corruption of fungibility in which things had their true value and the world really meant something. It's the ultimate ideological fantasy, this kind of like primordial subconscious of human financial interest you're just ticking all the boxes for you <laughs> my average yeah this is for you but you agree right no? yeah absolutely. yeah, yeah. Jen, Jen Lee knows yeah. a lot more about this yeah, is the point gonna... where we say Jen Lee, please teach a finance <laughs> class because that's what i really hope we will get from you eventually um okay and so i mean i'm still making an argument i know it seems very associative but but trust me there's like a point to this <laughs> which is that fungibility is what nietzsche called das gleichsetzen das nicht gleichsetzen uh, in other words, the equation of that which is not equitable, that which is not the same, a cow and a bag of rice. Through money, we can tally them up as being having equivalent value. The problem, of course, is, and this is how we go into the symbolic order for Lacan, is now we need to decide what they're worth. Right? Because just because we now have fungible tokens, money, dollar bills, now we have to decide how much is the cow worth in relation to the rice. And so the process of abstraction by which we take one concrete thing into another thing means that we have to fill in what is the universal framework of value. And that is what for Marx is the false universal. For Marx, every universal is false, not because it's bad, but because it relies on the ideological abstraction by which we suggest that there is a world in which a cow can be measured according to the value of a bag of rice. 
And this is super important because this is the opening chapter of Capital. And a lot of times, I mean, if you start here, it's the most obvious, almost pointless thing. And you can't understand why Marx is spending so much time yeah. talking about a coat and a table. But it's precisely, and this is why the discussion about ideology is so important. It's precisely in these moments where there's something that seems so obvious, so ordinary, so boring that is precisely the moment of most powerful ideology because we are all so um, suffused with the understanding of what value is that we don't even see how this transaction and this transition from non-fungible to fungible is totally radical and totally ideologically driven. Yeah, yes. No, no, it's perfect <laughs> yeah, what you're yeah. saying because mm -hmm. the fact that you're paraphrasing the beginning of capital is so, so fundamentally important, which what you've mentioned here, like, Jenling is being genuinely genius here. I'm not just like flattering <laughs> no. you. This is not ass kissing. It's that um, you said what appears normal is in fact entirely mystical. Mm -hmm. That's how Marx writes about it. And the, Zizek's argument in the sublime object of ideology is, I think it's like chapter one, is that there is an analogy to be made between Freud and Marx. Zizek quite famously, for people who are into this stuff, argues that it was Marx who invented the symptom, the symptom, not Freud. What does that mean? Well, again, wait, where are you going? I'm eating water. Okay, so basically, what Zizek is arguing is that Freud and Marx are doing something that is analogous between the analysis of the commodity fetish and the analysis of the dream. Now, for Marx, the analysis of the commodity fetish isn't to say, let's analyze this thing that seems so mystical, right? Let's analyze how people could value something like a golden carafe or a golden sink or something. No, no, it's the exact opposite. How is it something that is entirely ordinary becomes treated mystically? How does something that is a particular substance take on the attributes of a universal valuing structure and most importantly, how does this process of fungibility then create an entire consciousness that comes with it? In other words, you take two things that are particular concrete entities, the cow and a bag of rice, you create dollar bills which make them fungible, you create a universal system of value that then has to be upheld by means of consciousness, in other words, by ideology. And so ideology is necessary for the value system not to crumble. Mm -hmm. And that's what Marx is interested in, taking something that seems ordinary and finding what is, how does it create this extraordinary mystical idea of being alive itself. The fact that your very experience of being a person becomes tied to the necessity of this fungibility process by which we can exchange a cow and a bag of rice. And this is why it's so important, I think, to really emphasize that it's not about living in a world that's ideological and throwing off the shackles of ideology and saying we can live in an ideology-free world because the ideology is, is continued, is sustained by this illusion that it's all meaningless, that a shirt is a shirt whether or not it has a swoosh. There's that's a, what propels the ideology forward. I came up yeah. with an aphorism for this, but it only works in German. <laughs> because some... I, like, um, like, fun fact it. about me, about Julian, is basically, like, I'm more German than American. I just sound very American. But uh, in German, you can say, alle Moral is Doppelmoral, which sort of roughly translates... All standards to, are double standards. All standards are double standards. But it's also specifically morality and bourgeois morality, which is that alle Moral is Doppelmoral goes back to every standard is double standard, as in every fungibility, every $1 bill is precipitated on the idea that there is a concrete universality between cow and rice. Mm -hmm. That is what goes underneath. And so what, Zizek, uh, what Jenlin said about Zizek, which is that the ultimate ideological idea is that you could step out of ide ideology, is a continuation of the Marxist argument that underneath this false universal, which is true in that it creates the concrete reality that we live in, right? That's Hegelian abstract to concrete reality. Mm -hmm. There is nothing underneath that that is true. You can't go back to the originary value that is pre-ideological. So what you can change is the way in which you fill in the ideology. It's not stepping out of ideology itself. And of course, it's exactly the free market, ultra capitalist, technocratic Libertarian. libertarians who say, this is why the exchange of goods is the utopian space, is the non-ideological space, because only within 
free exchange of goods, can we be not ideological? Well, and they that's want to the come full, like circ full circle NFTs to the barter economy. Exactly. But here's what's so fascinating about NFTs is that as soon as you go into NFTs, which is already the chiasmic structure of cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. if you think about it, cryptocurrency starts with the properly, and I mean properly as in like literally utopian idea, that you could have a world that exists only on the idea of fungibility. There is nothing underneath, supposedly, the fungibility of crypto, mm -hmm. nor anything above. In other words, no central authority. Now, of course, you could immediately, from like a Hegelian perspective, say that crypto only works in this unconscious symptomatic space. Crypto is symptomatic of the false universal of the dollar reserve currency. But that aside, if crypto in its ideal universal utopian form, and I mean utopian as in that where nothing is lacking, right? A proper, fully universalized exchangeability in which fungibility is everything. Mm -hmm. NFTs are the B to the A. The NFT is the negation of that principle from within the utopian ideal of the cryptocurrency. Because an NFT is, of course, a non-fungible token. A token that has value precisely because of its symbolic relation to other tokens. And here we've created, because we're getting back to Lacan, here we're at the subject of the enunciation and this subject of the enunciated. If we have the supposedly pure realm of enunciation, which is that of fungible crypto tokens, it is on the level of the subject of the enunciation, which is its seeming negation through speech, in this case through non-fungibility, by which the very value of the original token is increased. In other words, the premise of a so-called utopian, where nothing is lacking, crypto space of purely fungible tokens is now raised in price by its perceived opposite through non-fungible tokens. And what's beautiful, and I know I'm being recklessly Hegelian here, is that the non-fungible token is the negation of negation. It's the negation of the fungibility that raises the value of the original fungible token. And ironically, we are precisely here back at the Hegelian idea of the concrete and the abstract. For Hegel, abstract wasn't that which had no, had no like- ephemeral. Ephemeral, exactly, thank you. No ethereum, <laughs> no ephemeral. <laughs> and concrete is what's in the world, like yeah. this table. For Hegel, it's the exact other way around. It's that what is abstract is concrete. And what is concrete is abstract. What he means by that is that table only exists in relation to its symbolic function to the dinner table, to sitting at the table, to having a room of one's own or to sit at the table of power, etc. The table takes on form concretely through abstraction. Mm -hmm. And it's precisely abstraction, such as the token, that takes on form through its concrete fall, descent into its negation, which is, of course, the non-fungible token. And here we have the chiasmic dialectic, which is that the abstract materializes itself through its perceived fall into the concrete, fungible into non-fungible, and vice versa, the seemingly concrete, the table, materializes itself by means of falling into the abstraction of what it means to be at the table, an object of design. Yeah, and if you don't think that the table has that kind of power, think about the images that the Kremlin releases of Putin sitting at his table. I mean, that is all symbolic power. That is all symbolic authority. And so we're actually in a, I agree with you, we're actually in a weird way back at structuralism mm -hmm. because what is the ultimate structuralist work of art? And I mean structuralism as in like the combination of linguistics and philosophy, right? That's what I mean by structuralism. Ceci n'est pas, n'est pas une pipe. <laughs> yes. This is not a pipe, Magritte. right? Magritte, exactly. Magritte. We're back at the pipe that is not a pipe. What is that the artwork of? I am not lying. It is exactly the same principle that Lacan is talking about, which is the I am not lying, where you go from the subject of the enunciation to the subject of the enunciated. In other words, the paradoxical situation by which the concrete becomes abstract and abstract concrete, and retroactively the, the illusion of subjectivity is formed. Magritte makes the exact same argument with Cécine Espace and Pipe, which is not only, this is not Duchamp, we're not in the world of Duchamp. Duchamp is simply saying everything can be art, the sacred and the profane, the most ultimately standard object, the urinal, is art. Duchamp is in the world of the worst person in the world, where she says that cheating by not cheating is to watch somebody else pee into the urinal. Mm -hmm. Duchamp is saying the highest form of art isn't the cathedral. The highest form of art is the urinal, right? 
That's the logic. But from a Greek, we're in a structuralist position, which is the subject of I am not lying, the contradictory split subject, the enunciation of spaltung itself, which retroactively creates the illusion of subjectivity, the subject of the unconscious for Lacan, is what Magritte means by to see n'est pas un peep. Of course, this is for the vulgar Freudians here. The peep is also a phallic object. Yes? No. No. <laughs> vulgar Freudianism. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this is also true for vulgar feminism. Mm -hmm. This is something I've argued before. Is that, and by vulgar feminism, I'm not saying that like, there's good feminism and bad feminism, which is itself like a whole liberal moralizing about like, what it means to be a proper feminist. The vulgar feminism in the same... So, okay, so let me put it like this. What is vulgar Marxism? Mm -hmm. Vulgar Marxism is to reduce everything to class difference. And what's, the reason it's vulgar is because the Marxist insight is actually to say that the idea of competition between classes is itself part of bourgeois morality. And so to reduce everything to class competition is to affirm the false universal of bourgeois itself. In other words, to affirm the idea that there is a ladder, a hierarchy upon which you work your way up. Of course, this is also why the, the working class for Marx isn't necessarily about wearing a working class cap and having identities of working class. There's nothing natural for Marx about working class identity. Instead of working class consciousness is precisely the realization that what you thought was a ladder you're working up isn't a ladder at all. The moment of realization that you are not on the lowest rung, but that there is a sub-basement rung, a voice of the, uh, like a, a part of no part, as the post-Marx would put it, is what creates the heaven for everybody else. This is Brecht's idea. Brecht says that um, God was lazy. Brecht argues that God was lazy because God didn't create heaven and hell. God realized that he could skimp, that he could create one place and make it heaven for some and hell for everybody else. That's the Marxist insight. It's not that you could work your way up into the transcendental sphere of financial heaven. It's that it's precisely because you are forever stuck in hell that the universal illusion of heaven can remain in place. Okay, vulgar Marxism disavows this and simply focuses on the competition between classes. It upholds the idea that there's a ladder that you can walk up and down. Now, the same thing is true for vulgar feminism, right? Or let's say vulgar Freudianism. Let's do it step by step. We have vulgar Marxism. What is vulgar Freudianism? Vulgar Freudianism is to reduce everything to the phallic object. Skyscrapers <laughs> are examples of the phallus. Or neckties, neckties are an example of the phallus. It's a great we, David Graeber piece. In the Baffler, uh, yeah. From the Baffler a few years ago. But he's not a vulgar, yes. he's yes, not a no, vulgar it's more Freudian. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and, and the idea is that if we get rid of these seemingly vulgar, phallic objects, we will have a more equal, pure society. Of course, the, the ultimate vulgar argument is to say, let's replace them with rounded objects. You know, I myself made a vulgar Freudian argu uh, argument to Jenlene this morning. Jenlene and I were going for a walk in the park here in Boston, Boston mm -hmm. Common. Common, by the way. Common is Marxism, communism, very nice. Okay, we're walking through the park. And a lot of the paths are like this. They're like sloped mm. instead of straight. And I observed to Jenny, and this was an incredibly crass cultural vulgar Freudian analysis. I said, I didn't say that the pathways were phallic, but I did say this. Straight roads, the grid of an imperial city lends itself to goose stepping, marching, and tanks. And that the ultimate sign of an emancipated society is a society in which you have no straight roads, only curvy roads. Now, can I give you one more example of this? The ultimate example of this, to prove my point, mm. is the difference between Sydney and Berkeley. Not Sydney and Berkeley, uh, sorry, yeah. uh, Sydney and Melbourne. Yeah. Sydney and Melbourne, Australia. Sydney was the imperial city, the city of high society. Sydney's on a, uh, no, I've got it wrong. Sorry, I'm, I'm too tired. Melbourne was the city of high society. Melbourne was the city of the empire. empire. Melbourne is on a grid. Sydney was where they sent the convicts. <laughs> Sydney is where they had the mass gallows. Sydney was a prisoner colony. And if you misbehaved in Europe, they would send you off. <laughs> to the twisty road. <laughs> to Sydney to never be heard of again. Sydney is not built on a grid. In other words, the emancipation of the ultimate subject outside of society, the criminal, is precisely Sydney. It's the no structure. And this is how we get back to Foucault. Because Foucault argued in discipline and punishment, that prisons had become the place where we reformed and where we crafted the idea of the prisoner. And that's how prisons become 
narrow and singular and making you into an object of the carceral state. I love the idea that when you were sent to Sydney, you were sent to the lawlessness. <laughs> this is Mad Max. This is like, there's no grid. Anyway, I'm romanticizing it. It's obviously very horrific, and there's racial components here as well. When it came to black people and women who were protesting, were sent off to Sydney, never to be heard of again, etc. Okay, we're still making an argument about what is the relationship between vulgar, this is a very long tangent, <laughs> what is the relationship between vulgar Marxism, vulgar Freudianism, and vulgar feminism? And we already said that for vulgar Freudianism, you look at phallic objects like skyscrapers or neckties and you say these are bad because they look like a Jeff penis is rocket. rocket they look yeah rocket and if we made them round they would somehow not be like this um the, what this makes would it, be no, the triumph of the feminine and this is the link to vulgar feminism I no think. no the link here is about what is the what is the universal and the particular okay. is there a universal subset that is pure in which the particular is a debasement of it in other words the you know phallic looking objects but in the same way that vulgar Marxism reduces everything to class struggle, rather than realizing that class consciousness is the realization that there is no equal class struggle, the same is true with vulgar Freudianism, which is that it's not saying that some people succeeded in creating symbolic objects of male authority. It's realizing that male authority is the false universal, that male authority is the empty, hollow space that doesn't actually exist except through the reinforcement of the patriarchy, through the process by which women, in order to hold on to their own power, uphold the frail and empty ego of the idea of male universality. And this is, doesn't make women complicit, we're not blaming women, but that it becomes a, a, a process by which the very idea of female power is made manifest within the structure of male authority. To go back to the vulgar Marxism, if you think of society as a ladder by which you walk up the rungs, the point of actual Marxism is to say, wait, there is no ladder. I have to be down here so you can uphold the illusion of a ladder. The same is true with vulgar Freudianism and actual Freudianism and feminism. The idea isn't that there is a hierarchy between men and women who are in competition. It's precisely because you've suggested that there is a competition between men and women that you've disavowed the false universal of masculine authority itself. That's the analogy that we have here between Marx, Freud, and feminism, essentially. Okay, this is a long tangent, but we, remember, we're talking about Zizek's theory of the subject. Zizek's theory of the subject is the Lacanian split subject, the subject of Spaltung. And what is the subject split by? The subject is split by the difference between enunciation and the enunci uh, enunciation enunciated, between enunciation and the statement. In other words, the subject is the subject of I am lying. I am lying by participating in the symbolic order, and yet by means of lying and by means of participating in the symbolic order, I construct the idea of myself. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of your own personhood becomes a retroactive illusion precipitated by and necessitated by your participation in society, by your participation in the beautiful lie. You cannot function in society without participating in this lie. Even in this song that Hegel already writes about, even on the basis of manners, simple, what he calls Zittlichkeit, simply being able to be polite, requires you to be able to tell convincing little lies. <laughs> Something like, how are you today? I'm doing great, when in fact you're doing garbage. Because you know that if somebody says, how are you, and you said, honestly, I want to kill myself, you know that that person would be like, wait, I didn't want to know that. Why are you telling me this? The whole point is that you have this bargain, this pact within civic society, that the other person will politely acknowledge your presence as a person, so that you can then politely acknowledge him as not being sufficiently close to you. One of the worst things you can do in society is to misread this authentic false gesture. If somebody says, you can tell me anything, you probably shouldn't tell them anything, right? And this is the whole point by which we create a false sense of familiarity to allow ourselves the distance which is necessary to be a person. And when I was a child, I experienced this very vividly where my parents would have dinner parties and they invited all of their friends. And then after the dinner party, they'd be dissecting the dinner and essentially talking shit about their friends. And I remember being completely outraged because the child, one of the, the reason that child is the utopian space mm -hmm. is children believe that there's a direct like morality between love and hate, between loyalty and disloyalty. And so I was like, how, and I, I remember being scandalized and I yelled at my parents and I said, 
How can you call these people your friends if you're saying such mean things about them? <laughs> and this is where I hadn't read yet. I think this is, you have to read, um, uh, uh, I'm blanking here, um, the play. I'm just being tired. Oscar. Oscar Wilde. No, importance no. Of no, not importance of being earnest. Yeah, maybe it is the importance of being earnest, which is that it could be Oscar Wilde. He's always very radical, which is that the definition of a friend is that you can talk shit about them. <laughs> now, on two levels, on the one hand, a friend is somebody that you can be vulgar to. Zizek writes about this a lot, right? That you can cuss with a friend. You can say mean things to a friend. Like part of the intimacy of friendship is that you can be a little bit unhinged with that person. You don't have to uphold the morality of civic politeness. And so in this very, like, again, Hegelian concrete abstract, the sign of a friend is that you treat them like crap. Plato already said, uh, sorry, Aristotle said, a friend, my friends, there is no friend, right? To say my friend, there is no friend, is to see this pus and peep. It's there is no pipe, I am lying. It's that contradictory participation by which you being a friend means precisely that they don't have to exist within the realm of acquaintances, within the realm of the symbolic order. That there's something more true in the friend precisely because it's a form of falsehood. Of course, the real falsehood is the universal consciousness of society, which means that precisely by means of your being uncivil to your friend, you find a kernel of truth within the falsehood of friendship itself that retroactively posits the falsehood of the universal. Here we have, again, the Marxist idea that class consciousness is the universal particular, the particular that undermines and disavows the particular from within. Imagine society as being a hierarchy of friendship in which you give people points for how much they are your friend and the people at the top have all the points and the people at the bottom have the lowest points. That would be bourgeois morality. It would be the idea of competition between. No, no, the friend is precisely the one who's the part of no part. The friend can be the person that you can say, well, screw society. With you, I am honest. With you, I don't have to uphold any kind of illusion. And this is to bring us back to the beginning of the class when we talked about the worst person in the world, the movie. This is the cheating without cheating. It's saying, if I cheated with you and we had sex, that would be bourgeois. This is why the French extensors argued that cheating and infidelity is the most bourgeois thing you can do. We present it as being an act of like hedonism and the idea that ultimate you're like betrayal. ultimate yeah. betrayal, but also like, you know, oh, we're all these like um, these uh, artistic types and we all get to sleep with each other. Mm -hmm. No, no, that is the most bourgeois thing. The idea of upholding your civic union, your marriage, but also cheating on the side and the woman kind of knows, but she also doesn't or the man knows and doesn't. That's bourgeois morality. That's everybody gets a certain amount of points as long as it fits. It's precisely the most radical thing you can do is to say, I'm going to cheat with you, but we're not gonna to touch each other. We're gonna cheat with each other by doing the things only a friend would do. I'm gonna to go to the bathroom in your presence. I'm gonna tell you something I wouldn't tell anybody else. In other words, what's so, so sad about that scene is that she cheats on the man, not by means of a carnal relationship, but by means of becoming for one night his best friend. And that is the ultimate betrayal. It's to say my marriage and my partnership is simply an application of civility. And that my betrayal is to say I give my true self, my friendship, the illusion of who I really am to somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's almost worse than cheating, worse than sleeping with someone. And that's why the title of the movie is The Worst Person in the World. In a very weird, messed up way, she's done something worse than kissing a random handsome guy at a party. She's given herself intimately to him. And that would be more devastating. Think about what would, if somebody, if your partner cheated on you, what would be worse? If they said, I made out with someone at a party, or if you say, we spent the night together laughing and talking about philosophy, and she went to the bathroom and I gave her all my intimate secrets. That's, that's <laughs> so much worse. Um, it reminds me yeah. actually, there was a movie a few years ago with Kiara Knightley and I can't remember the title, but it's precisely this point. It's a couple, he goes away on a business trip and she meets with an old fling. And they That's both love, I think. cheat on each other. No, it's, oh, it really? isn't. Okay. They both cheat on each other, but in different ways. And so that's sort of the question is like, what level of betrayal, what kind of betrayal is more right. substantial? Yeah. And so I want to wrap up here by going back to Zizek's theory of the subject, because we've already said it's a Lacanian subject. It's the subject of the unconscious, which is the split subject, the subject of I am lying, the subject of a paradoxical unity that exists precisely outside the ideology of I am a person in the world. That in a weird way, and this is like a simplification, that Lacan says that your true self 
is precisely the self that feels untrue. That the fact that you can't be authentically you, that you don't authentically inhabit your personhood, that is the very precondition for personhood itself. It's also why Zizek has taken the Lacanian idea over and over again and said that your mask is your real you. The ultimate illusion is that underneath the mask, there is your true self. In the, in the same way that the ultimate illusion is that underneath your ego is the subconscious. In the same way that for Marx, the ultimate illusion is that underneath your class participation is a universal basis of common morality. In the same way that it's an illusion that underneath the, non, uh, underneath the fungibility of the dollar bill, there's some kind of originating value. Mm -hmm. Underneath, in the same way it's an illusion that for within feminism, that between the competition of the sexes, there's some kind of urgrund of pure authentic masculinity and femininity that we can tap into. In the same way that ultimately within psychoanalysis, it's the ultimate illusion that underneath your speech, there is a speeching, speechifying thinking subject. In other words, we are back at Descartes the Cartesian subject. I think, therefore, I am. Lacan is simply playing around and messing from within and dismantling the idea of the Cartesian subject. It's not, I started with a thought and then I expressed myself. I expressed myself, which created a thought. And I had a thought, which was that I was the originally expressing myself person. Lacan has like six different ways of rewriting almost in a poem, I think, therefore, I am. And he finally comes up with where I am not, there I think. The place that is lacking within yourself, the constitutive negativity of personhood, which is both its precondition and its inevitable consequence, that empty space which is retroactively filled in and posited as an authentic vessel, that is the I am not where I don't think. That is the empty space of ideology itself. That is the sublime object, the space that you think anticipates and precedes your own subjectivity, which is in itself a marker of your failure to be a completed subject. It's also why Foucault, Foucault's theory of discourse takes the fundamental insight of structuralism, but not the fundamental conclusion. If the fundamental insight of structuralism is precisely that we are created by speech, that we are not objects who speech, uh, subjects who speak, that but we are objects of speech, right? We are the subjects of the enunciation, the subject of the station statement. We are creations of our own speechifying, as it were. Foucault takes that and says, well, if I can create myself, then I can take charge of how I create myself. In other words, Foucault, and I love Foucault, but Foucault, with the theory of discourse, has a fundamental misattribution that since you can create your own self through speech, and you are created through speech, you could liberate your authentic self, biopolitics. You could create and fight for your originary unity of being. And so Foucault misses the fundamental aspect of the structuralist insight, which is that there is no a priori you. There's no universal consciousness which has to be guarded and protected. And we can talk more about this in Discord, but this also brings us back to identity politics. One of the difficulties about identity politics as much as we should always champion the emancipatory potential of civic rights, of the freedom to speech, of insisting that we have a more equal representation of different identities within our society, which is fundamental if you want to have a healthy functioning society. At the same time, there's a danger, a metaphysical misassumption in the idea that there is an original identity that has to be protected and cultivated against the idea of corruption or that can be misrepresented or misidentified. Identity shouldn't be an originary or a priori substance. Instead, identity should be the name of the impossibility of identity itself. In the LBGTQ plus sequence, the plus is the most important. The plus is the radically open, teleologically infinite, without proper ontology, to be very abstract, point, the point of openness itself, the formal marker of incompleteness. In other words, the most concrete form of that which is abstract, which is identity. And so where Foucault goes wrong is in the idea that just because you are the creation of your own enunciation, that you could create anything. The whole point for Lacan is that we are precisely bound by our own speech, that as soon as we speak, we fall into symbolic relations, and that the rest of what we experience as life is trying to escape our symbolic attachment, which we now confuse with our very being. 
And that is the project of emancipation of the subject within psychoanalysis. Remember, psychoanalysis isn't the process by which you further mystify yourself so as to better participate in society. Psychoanalysis is to demystify yourself to the point in which you don't understand how you fit into society. It's not a comforting theory, psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis starts by making you uncomfortable in a purely psychoanalytic practice. It shouldn't create disassociation, but it should ultimately induce hysteria, which is it should affirm a radical questioning of that which appears to be complete. And here we have the final analogy that Zizek makes between Marxism and psychoanalysis. If Marxism is the moment of class consciousness, in other words, the moment in which the particular subset of working class identity realizes that not only is it not part of the universal, but that it's very not partness is what is required to keep the umbrella, the mirage of the universal in place. In fact, that there, once you realize this, there is no universal. That is a nihilistic point. And that nihilistic point is what Marx calls revolution. Revolution isn't saying I will violently fight against the system. Revolution is once I have seen that there is no system, suddenly the support, the ideological support for my identity falls away. And that is the emancipated subject within psychoanalysis. It's not the subject that has properly constituted itself within the overarching structure of the universal. It's the subject that has come to realize that the universal was only ever a retroactive illusion that came about because the particular thought that its identity came through the universal. That is the emancipated subject. It is a subject of pure split, a subject where nothing is lacking. And that is precisely the subject of utopia, the subject that can then be filled in in a radical way, unbound by a previously existing universal. That is the analogy that Zizek makes between the idea of Marxism and psychoanalysis. Now, what are we gonna do next week? Next week, we're gonna take the theory of Zizek's subject, of subjectivity, and we're gonna relate it back to metaphysics because Lacan is making a metaphysical argument. He's making an argument about Hegel this is why Lacan calls Hegel the most sublime hysteric. So next week, if you join us, we're going to take Zizek's theory of subjectivity, and we're going to take this psychoanalytic idea and inject it back into the philosophical argument we're trying to make about the relationship between Kant, Hegel, and Marx. Until then. Join us on Discord, where we will be. Um, information is in the bio. It is $5 a month on Patreon, so if you want to sign up, it is about halfway through the month, so you'll be charged for this month and however long you'd like to support us. So we hope you'll join us. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, send us a message and check it out and um, hope you can join us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenlene, for creating this welcome. space. Thank you for hosting this. Yeah. Thank you for organizing our community so well. I yeah. feel so incredibly lucky <laughs> that I get to do this. Thank you for, Me too. Thank you for making that. So thank you guys. Yeah. And we'll see you on Discord. Bye guys. <laughs>